said, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in his life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Back to hymn number 239. Hymn number 239. Ask the blessing of the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for the blood you shed and life you gave on the cross, Lord, to pay our debt for our sins. We thank you, Lord, that our salvation is a gift where we could never, ever gain it on our own. 
We thank you, Lord, that the world didn't give it and the world can't take it. Amen. Amen. We pray, Lord, that you'll prepare our hearts for the preaching of your word. We will align our hearts with your word and with your will. Help us, Lord, to take what we hear, apply it to our lives, and share it with others. Help us, Lord, to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We pray, Lord, if there's one among us in the need of salvation, that they be the day they come to know you as their Savior. We pray, Lord, that we will bring honor and glory to your name here today with the songs we sing and the words that we say. We ask, Lord, to take this offering, bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mamie Caesar. Stand together. Turn over to hymn number 334.
I'm number 334. Turn back to hymn number 246. Hymn number 246. After the first verse, we'll, the choir will come down and we'll go around and greet each other. Welcome each other to the house of the Lord this morning. Beneath that blood, lose all their guilty 
number 246. Hymn number 246 will be on that last verse. And in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. seated. Turn over to hymn number 270. Hymn number 270. I do have a special Lewis's. They'll come, Sister Kim, as well. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Come on up. Oh, <laughs> 
Love to hear wonderful promises and song. Amen. Amen. If you would, let's take your Bibles this morning. I invite you to turn with me to the book of Genesis. We'll be in chapter number 13. Genesis chapter number 13. <clears throat> and whenever you find your place, if you're able, I'll invite you to stand with me one more time this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 13. We're going to look at the first four verses. We'll look at a lot of the chapter, but we'll start off in these for introduction here. Chapter 13, verse number 1. You there? Say amen. amen. It says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. I want to bring our message this morning of establishing a godly nation. Establishing a godly nation. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you once again for the great privilege it is to be able to be in your house today. Lord, we uh, don't want to take this lightly of what it is, the, the freedoms that you've given us. And we pray, God, that you would allow your word just to be able to I find this place in our heart, Lord, that we would be abiding in Christ, following you, and honoring you in all things. And Lord, I pray, Father, if there's one here that doesn't know Jesus Christ, is their personal Savior that today would be the day of salvation. And Lord, we come on behalf of this nation. We pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, to return to what it is that you established it to be. And we thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. Saw a statement recently. It said, This election in November will either save our nation or sink our nation. And I thought about that. There's, a, there's truly a lot that's riding 
upon this election as far as the understanding that we have of freedom and democracy and, and things of that nature, probably more so than there has been in, in certainly in recent time. Uh, we're, we're close to socialism as a nation as it is. Uh, we don't like to admit it too much, but whenever you look at it, short of just somebody branding the label, that's kind of where it is. Uh, the government has already uh, seeks uh, some political uh, overreach in many key areas of life. That's what government has been trying to do forever. It's nothing, shouldn't be anything new to us there. Uh, but, um, you know, they already kind of uh, established control over health care, and, and doctors can't hardly doctor without insurance approval and, and all of those type of things. Government overreaches in the matter of, of education. Uh, I was listening to a, a, a lawyer, he was talking about. Uh, the number is a Christian uh, Christian Law Association, but he was uh, he made mention of uh, how many cases that they have every single week of those that that try to get their uh, services because of the education system. And and he said just he said they have lawsuits that show up whenever somebody gives a biblical account of Jesus and salvation, and somebody wants to sue over it. Uh, the the government. Uh, has a way of saying that parents are told that they're supposed to be the birthing agents, but the government knows best about what it is for your kids. And you see that in a lot of the education. Uh, we understand the, the overreach that's there with media. Uh, you, you get to know the things that the, that the government says that they'll allow you to know. Otherwise, it's branded as hate speech or something of that nature. Matter of fact, this sermon may be branded as that before the, the day's over. We've it happens. But, uh, but anyway, uh, there's a lot of those things that transpire on a daily basis. But the longevity and the blessing of this nation does not rest in the hands of the politicians. Uh, it rests in the hands of God. Amen. Uh, our candidates, whenever you look at the candidates that we have, that is a reflection of the spiritual aptitude of, of our nation. The most pressing issue that we face is not about a political party. Uh, the most pressing issue that any one of us faces is our submission to the very will of God. If we, were, uh, if we were a nation that was set to honor God, let me just tell you, neither one of our candidates would be on the ballot. Uh, that's not knocking your party or your favorite person or anything of that nature, but it's a matter of modeling godliness. That decision of godliness uh, that we have to face individually and as a nation, as a state, as a church, uh, those are the things that's as old as this, this text. And uh, in Genesis chapter number 12, God had called uh, Abram to depart out of his pagan homeland, and, uh, and they were idolaters. And God said uh, in chapter 12, verse number 2, he says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. Uh, you know, God loves to do things like that. Amen? Uh, God loves to be able to make things new. Uh, we see that in creation of how it is that He spoke this world into existence. We saw it after He judged this world because of the heinous nature of sin that had prevailed and, and uh, during Noah's time and how much that He, uh, after He judged the earth, he, he made us a whole new world. Amen? We had a whole new opportunity. And it's true in an individual as well. He rejoices to be able to see a person be made new in the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And you look at that and you think, man, if God delights in those things, if He delights in being able to make things new, if He delights in being able to make a person new, a, a nation new, He makes a people, a church new, where, where we're restored and walking in favor with Him, what is it that prevents it? What is it that prevents it? Well, either there's a lack of opportunity, there's a lack of understanding, or there's rebellion against what it is that God has established. Now that said, Abram is going to have to face a decision. God has already told him what it was that he planned. He already shared that he was going to make him a great nation. So, so Abram could either follow God's lead and be rewarded for his faith, or he could rebel and miss the very blessings and the provisions of God. So what is it then that Abram is going to do? How is Abram going to uh, bring about this thing that God has, has promised? Now there's a couple of things that's not going to go by. Uh, Abraham is not going to lead a godly nation because of his family qualifications. Amen? Matter of fact, God said, you're going to have to leave your family behind because they're a bunch of idolaters. He says, I'm taking you out of that land. We're going to do something. Uh, God's going to do something. So he's going to have to leave those family ways behind. Also, Abram was not chosen by God to establish a nation by his own personal perfection. 
Now, this is always important, especially whenever you read somebody like Abram that's in the Faith Hall of Fame there in Hebrews chapter number 11. We exalt them to a level where they're like, man, I wish I had the faith of Abram. Uh, that's, that's probably true. And he was a great man of faith, but he was also prone to make some mistakes along the way. Uh, whenever you start digging in, you start looking at biology, uh, biology, biographies in Scripture, uh, you find out that people are not always as perfect as what it is that one sermon can make them seem. We, we give Lot a hard time. We're going to give him a hard time here in just a little bit. And, uh, but uh, as he goes on through the, uh, the passage here, he's, uh, we get down in chapter 13 and verse number 12, and we find that he's pitching his tent towards Sodom. But, and we think, man, that's horrible. But where did he learn it? Where did he learn it? Probably from Abram. Back in chapter 12, look at verse number 8. It says, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, Hai on the east, and there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So far, so good. Amen. Verse number 9 says, And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. What was Abram doing? Listen, he pitched his tent. He set up an altar. He was going through a lot of religious things, a lot of religious ceremonies, but he was facing Egypt. And he kept going to Egypt. Now, so, so we start looking at that, and they're like, man, well, what's so bad about Egypt? Egypt is always a picture of the world in Scripture. It's an alternative to God's provision. Sure enough, there's going to be a drought that's going on. They're going to go on down into Egypt. Uh, he could have trusted in God to provide. In Isaiah 31, in verse number 1, it says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses, and trust in chariots, because they're many, and in horsemen, because they're very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. There was that time of famine. Abram goes down into Egypt. What was he doing? He was trusting the world instead of God. Whenever he got there, think about what happened. He immediately lied about the relationship that he had between him and his wife. Why was that? Uh, his wife was pretty. He said, man, if I walk into a pretty wife, they're just going to kill me and take her. So what was he doing? He said, he walks in and he says, tell everybody that you're my sister. You know, it didn't take him long to figure that out. That was wrong. But why would he do that? He, he wanted to save his own neck. Yep. Amen. Th that was it. He wasn't worried about her. He's like, man, this is not good for me. What's he doing? You know, the more that you take those steps to get away from God's provision and the godliness and being able to rest in him before long, there's other decisions that you start make that are of the flesh uh, instead of, of God as well. Uh, so he was afraid of the people. He should have been abiding in the will of God. So he wasn't to build a nation on his own goodness any more than he was to be building a nation on his own family name. He was going to have to get to the point where he's going to rely on God. You know, it's a blessing for us to be able to know that God can, God sees us for who we can be and not just who we are. Yes, Amen. Listen, God can take you from where you are and you can look and you, you can look around and say, man, my situation is horrible. I don't know how I'll ever be able to get through. And God will say, you won't if it wasn't for me. Amen. Amen? And we need to be looking to him all the time. Uh, lastly, Abram's wealth would not be the method that he would need to be able to establish the nation. Now, he had a lot of wealth, amen? And whenever Abram and the company are leaving Egypt, we're told in our passage that he had amassed this great amount of earthly provision. He had plenty of possessions. Verse number two says, And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. This is the first time uh, in your Bible where that word rich is used. It's rich. And it's specifically talking about having much. Amen? Uh, it's just a, it, that, that word rich is a statement of quantity. It doesn't mean it's a good thing. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means you got a lot of it. Now, Abram, uh, he had a lot of livestock. But that also means that he's going to have to have a lot of overhead. Amen? Uh, what does that mean? He's going to have to have a lot of grazing room for all of his cattle. He's got to have a lot of acreage to feed and to water the herds. So it doesn't take very long, and Abram's plenty becomes a source of contention between him and his nephew Lot. They've also got plenty. They're, they're coming out of, out of Egypt. They've got all their, all their cattle, all their livestock. Now they've got to have a place to feed, a place to water. They look out, and whether it's a well-watered plant or not, it's not enough to be able to sustain everything that is there for them to, to get together. And verse number 7 says, there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's uh, cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And, uh, and the parasites and the, and the, uh, or the Canaanites and parasites dwell in the land as well. So they've got this contention that comes about. Think about that. Uh, his, his family becomes competition for the resources. 
All of a sudden, there's, there's things that he's got, he's got much, but it's driving a wedge between him and the rest of the family. Listen, wealth is a great asset if you have the wisdom to steward it. Wealth of, often gets in the way of godliness. And if there is going to be the establishment of a great nation, what's it going to be? It's going to be because of God's leading and because his people are following. And can I tell you, the same thing is true for our nation today. Uh, the, the need of our nation is not going to be in a political candidate. It's going to be in the fact that God is leading and God's people need to be following. So what are the attributes that God can use in us, his people, to establish a godly nation. I think all of us in this room would, would say, you know, if there's one thing that we really need, one thing that we want, it's we want to return to godliness. Amen? We want to have a godly nation. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, a lot of it depends upon the decisions that are faced right here on a day-in and day-out basis right here in this room. Right. So how does it happen? First of all, God uses those who are separated for his glory separated for his glory. Now notice what it says here about Abram. We're going to use him of course as our, our pattern. Verse number one says, and Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. That's great. Abram went up out of Egypt. Can I say this? Everybody messes up. Amen? Everybody has problems. We can all find ourselves uh, in the dregs of life, usually because of bad decisions that have been made. Uh, the point is, though, is that you don't stay there. That's not where God wants you to be. Abram had the fortitude, finally, to get up out of Egypt. He's going to yeah, start going in the right direction. Now, if God's going to restore our nation, you know what it's going to be? Uh, there's going to be something that we're going to have to get up out of. What is it? We're going to have to get up out of our love and affection for the things of this world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, it is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now it's amazing because Lot reveals to us the repercussions. Now it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, we're going through here, we're talking about Abram. Abram's going to be this na great nation. And it just kind of slips in there. Abram's leaving home and Lot comes with him. You know, it's like one of those things. It's like, well, what's he doing with that? He's supposed to be leaving everybody, uh, you know, behind here. But here comes Lot. Lot comes with him. And then he's going into Egypt, and Lot just happens to be there. And then all of a sudden we get to this portion of the passage, and, and, and Abram is making some good decisions. He's getting out of Egypt. He's going the right way. He's setting up an altar. He's doing the right things. And then it says, now let's talk about Lot for a little while. Uh, this contention with Lot has finally just kind of blown up a little bit, and something has to be done. So let's look at the account real quick, starting in verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou wilt go to the right, I'll take the left. He's like, look, man, you decide. Amen? Uh, listen, Abram didn't look out there and say, I'll tell you what I'm taking, you get the leftovers. He didn't do that. He preferred Lot over his own interest. He says, listen, what, what was Abram doing? Abram said, man, I'm coming to the point of decision where I know God is going to be the one to take care of me. He said, you take care of whatever you think, but I'm going to let God uh, handle God's business. So verse number 10 says, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zor. Now isn't that interesting? Uh, Lot's looking out and he says, this looks just like that good land we just left. Man, that looks just like Egypt. I think I'd like to have some more of that. Verse 11 says, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners be for the Lord exceedingly. So uh, there was this contention, and uh, what happens is, is Lot is, is given a choice here. But Lot, uh, he stayed in love with the world. 
He makes this steady progression in the wrong direction. If you look at verses 10 through 12, he calls out each thing. First thing he did, he lifted up his eyes and he beheld. Your eye affects your heart, amen? And all of a sudden, he starts setting his eyes on the things that he shouldn't. Second, he chose him in verse number 11. He chose him all the plain of Jordan. And then it says that he separated from godly influence in verse number 11. He says, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go this way. You're going to go that way. And we're going to separate. Verse number 12 says that he dwelt in the cities of the plain. Verse number 12 says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And then he says uh, that it moves on in chapter 14. And verse number 12 says they uh, took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. He, he got to the point where he was not just pitching his tent there, but he dwelt there. Finally, if you look in chapter 19, verse number one, he'd become a judge in Sodom. He was sitting in the gate. His daughters were marrying the men of Sodom. His testimony was shot. The, the Lord sent word. He says, hey, about to destroy this place. And he goes to the, to the, uh, the sons-in-laws. He says, man, let's get up out of this place. He says, we got to go. God is about to, he is about to destroy it. We got to go. And it says they, they looked at him as one that mocked. He lost his whole testimony. He said, you're going to tell us what it is that we need to do. How did he get to that point? A love for the world. That was it. It was a love for the world. Now, what we cannot miss in this life of Lot is that he did face a place of decision. He had a place of decision himself. For Lot, in verse number 12, it says that he dwelt in the cities of the plain. Think about that. He dwelt in the cities of the plain. That means that he lived just outside of town. Just outside of town. He was, he was close enough to the boundary of the city to enjoy all the benefits of the city. But he was separated in appearance. Now get a hold of that. He was separated in appearance, but he was right on the border. And you know what happened? It didn't take long before sin overtook him. It didn't take long before he was right there where he wasn't supposed to be. Listen, whatever you set your eye toward will ultimately affect your heart. Abram made a different choice. Abram also had a choice. Amen. So again, verse number one of, of chapter 13, he says, he went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. He went up out of Egypt. He determined that he and his wife and all of his said, we're getting out. Amen. That's a good decision. Now, we start thinking about this in the manner of a nation and what it is that's needed, but it starts with an individual. It may be that today you're right on the edge. You're right on the edge. It may be that you're right at that place of decision. Now, you can still get back to where it is that you need to be, or you can make the wrong decision and you can get closer to the world. But if there's going to be an establishment of a godly nation, or for that matter, if there's an establishment of a godly church, of a godly home, a godly individual, it will not come through carnal Christianity. It will not come by saying, how close to the edge can I live? How much can I observe of the things of the world and be tempted with? It'll be by the decision to be separated to the Lord Jesus Christ. God never calls us to see how close to ungodliness that we can get. He points out ungodliness and he says, flee from it. Uh, get away from it. Don't love those things. Don't set those things before your eyes. Determine to get up out of the ways of the world. Secondly, God will use those who will return, not just getting out of Egypt, but will return to worship. Amen. They'll return to worship. Now look at what he says in verse number three. It says, and he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, and the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Now it's interesting, those, those names, remember those Bible names in Scripture, they, they mean a lot, amen? What does Bethel mean? Uh, Bethel means house of God, house of God. So he's got house of God on one side, and he was between Bethel and Hai. What does Hai mean? It means a heap of ruins. Think about that. He's right there in between the house of God and a heap of ruins. And it's a familiar place. This was the same place that he was at that we looked at in chapter 12 and verse number 8 before he went into Egypt. He was at that same spot before. He was between the, the house of God and a heap of ruins. And then it says, and he decided to keep on headed down south. He just decided to make, he's going to make, listen, folks, you still get to, a decision to make. Yeah. Amen. God is sovereign over all things. He is in control of all things, but he still gives you an opportunity to make a choice. 
He doesn't drag you where it is that he wants you to go, and, and all. he gives you the choice. He gives you understanding, and he allows you to have a choice. But you're going to deal with the repercussions of that choice. That's why he said we reap what it is that we that we sow. Amen. Not the things that are sowed for you. He didn't say, I'm going to sow some stuff for you and you reap it. No, he says, you reap what it is that you sow. So he's, he's been there before between the house of God and the heap of ruins, between Bethel and Hai, and he's gone into Egypt. He's seen the repercussions of it. But now whenever we get to our passage, he's on the way out. Amen. He's getting back to the place where he, he built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. See, this time though, the good part, he's between those two places, but he's facing the right way. He was, uh, what's he doing? Uh, he knows the old way is Egypt. What's the new way? That pilgrim life that God had called him to. God was directing and he was following. Now think about, think about the contrast here because this is what God does for us. He gives us this great contrast in Scripture. Lot had been at a place of decision and he chose the world and the destruction that went along with it. Abram is at a place of decision. What did he choose? Worship and blessing of God. Amen? Letting God lead. Can I tell you, if you're facing that decision, it's not a hard decision. Now, the temptation of the world is what it is that makes it hard because of the things of our flesh say, man, I really want that. But, but if we could just back up a second and say, what does God want? Yeah, yeah. Amen? Listen, God would spare us a lot of heartache and headache whenever we would just be faithful and yielded to Him and say, I'm going to get back to worship. I'm going to get back to being where God wants me to be and doing the things that God wants me to do. You have a choice in the matter. Now there's a great phrase here in verse number three. It says he went up uh, on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been, watch this, at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Now that's interesting right there. He says he brought him back to the place that he was at at the beginning. You would think of it and you're like, well, I thought at the beginning was in Ur of the Chaldees. I thought it was Ur was where he actually began. Uh, but, but that's not where God says his beginning point was. Whenever he left Ur, uh, he went to Haran and he stayed there for five years until his father died. Uh, his father was Terah. Terah died five years. Then he went to the land of Canaan. Now think about that. Abram, uh, at this point, he is five years and 800 miles into his journey from his homeland of Ur. And God, whenever God gets him back to that place, he says, this is your starting point. This is your starting point. It's not Ur. It's not the old life. That's not your starting point. It's, it's this place. See, real worship does not start, get this, real worship does not start when you just separate from the old life. Now, now get a hold of it. What does that mean? It means real worship does not necessarily start the day that you're saved. Right. Amen? So when does it start? Real worship starts when you surrender to the will of God. Amen. Oh, if you'll get to the place where you surrender to the will of God, he said, that's your starting point. That's the place that you need to be. Now notice he says in verse number four, he says, unto the place of the what? Altar. Amen. I like that a lot. He didn't say, I was going back to the old place where he set up, he still had the old tent pad there, uh, still had a fire pit. He didn't talk about any of that stuff, amen? He says, unto the place of the altar. He went to the location where the stones of the altar had been assembled in the past. He went to the place where the blood had been shed in the past. He went to the place where he could meet with God and where he had met with God in the past. He went to the place of surrender. See, Abram wasn't just interested in getting out of, uh, of, of Egypt. What did he want? He wanted to be close to God again. He wanted that fellowship with God again. That's what it is that he needed. Amen? Listen, it's interesting. Of the five years that he was in Haran, there's not one time mentioned that Abram had an altar. All the time that he spent in Egypt, not one mention that he had an altar in Egypt. It was a wilderness whenever he was out of fellowship with God, even being surrounded by people. What did he want? He wanted the fellowship. He wanted that fellowship with God restored. What we see of Abram's desire for worship, what is that? It's a great picture of the fruit of repentance. The fruit of repentance. See, there is no real worship without repentance. Now, what does that mean? It's often misconstrued. Repentance means you've got a changed mind. The decision is not between uh, the things in our life. It's not about saying, well, I'm going to choose what's vile or what's moral. Uh, can I tell you, that can be just reformation. Amen? That can be good common sense. 
Say, well, you know, this could hurt me, this could help me, I'll, I'll go this way. Uh, it's not just reformation. The decision that's really faced is the world's way or God's way. See, there is a way that we're to walk, and he says, choose that, that, uh, that good way and that right way and walk therein. We're supposed to be walking in accordance with God's way, and the world's way is separate from that. Now, whenever you've been going the world's way, You've been going your own way. You've been following after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And all of a sudden you realize this is on, I'm on the wrong way. Amen. And you decide you want to be on God's way. What does that mean? You're going to have to repent. Amen. Repent is me. You're going to have to have a changed mind about the way that you were on. You're going to have to change mind, change your mind about the direction that God wants you to be. You don't just move to a better place. Amen. Listen, Abram didn't just trade in his tent. What did he do? He got to where God wanted him to be. See, life can take you a lot of different directions. But if you want God's way, get back to the place of fellowship. Get back to the place of the cross. Back to the place where you see the love of God for you and that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross of Calvary for your sin. Get back to the place where you can see that Jesus became your sin so that you could be made the righteousness of God in him. Back to the place of thanksgiving. Back to the place of worship. You know, Jesus said, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Abram got back to the place of the altar. He got back to the place of worship. He, he got back to the place where he could call upon the name of the Lord and be heard. You know, it's interesting. Wouldn't you like to know what Abram said right there? I mean, man, he's, he goes back and he's like, there's the stones. Over time, I can imagine they've kind of slipped around a little bit. And he puts them all back together and, and he's back to the place, back to the time where he could be able to make some, uh, to call out to God a good place of worship. He calls on the name of the Lord and, and we're not told what it is that he says. But in my mind, you know what I think he says? I think he said, thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for your long suffering. Thank you, God, that you didn't give up on me. Thank you, God, for keeping me safe whenever I was in Egypt. Thank you, God, for the fellowship that you've allowed for me today. Thank you, God, for the freedom that you've given so that I can just approach you. I could imagine the more that he would spend time in thankfulness to God, he could say, God, I owe you everything. So God uses those that are separated for his glory. He uses those that are returned to a place of worship. Lastly, God uses those who desire His grace. They desire His grace. Now look down, we got past Sodom here and, and Lot. And look at what He says here in verse number 14. It says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him. Isn't that interesting? He's like, all right, there's a separation that goes on. God says, now, uh, now you're at the place where you're fulfilling what it was I told you to do to begin with. Amen? Imagine how much, imagine how much suffering we blame the world for a lot. Amen. But, but imagine how much suffering that we would not have to go through of the world whenever we would just do what God said the first time. Amen. And so, uh, so here he is. As the Lord said unto him, after the lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now it's interesting, he was able to, he was able to leave with his wife and all that he had and lot with him. He didn't have kids yet. Amen. That was a promise that God was given, but that's going to come in the future. And so, so here he is childless and he says, yet you're going to have a seed that you can't even number it. Amen. Verse number 17 now, watch this. He says, arise, Walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Now there again, there's a great contrast. Uh, whenever Abram and, and Lot were parting ways, whenever there was that contention that was there, you remember what Abram said to Lot? He, he told Lot, he said, lift up your eyes, look at the direction that you want to go, and go. Amen. He says, uh, lift up the eyes, uh, lift up your eyes. And look, uh, look what Lot did. Lot lifted up his, his eyes and he went the direction of the world. Now God gives Abram that same directive. He says, lift up your eyes and see what it is that I have prepared for you. 
You know what Abram did? Abram took the direction of God's grace. Not, not the world's promise, not the world's provision. He says, I'm going to go the way of the grace of God. You know, there, it's pretty interesting if you want to at home Bible study time. There's three different times that Scripture says Abram lifted up his eyes. Three different times. One of them is here in verse number 14. He lifted up his eyes and he saw the land that God had given to him. He said, lift up your eyes and look to the north, south, east, and west. Look, he says, this is what it is I've given to you. In chapter 18 and verse number 2, we find him again where he lifts up his eyes and guess who he sees? He sees the Lord himself. And that was whenever he came to Abram's tent. And he was, uh, that's whenever Abram found out that he was actually going to be a daddy. Amen? And he was like, man, I remember, I remember Sarah was in the house. Nothing was wrong with her hearing. Yeah, uh, she, she, she might have been old, but she could hear just fine. And, and remember, he says, you're, you're going to have a child. And she, she, within herself, she laughed. And the Lord said, what are you laughing about? Said, I didn't laugh. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. But that was the other time where, where Abram lifted up his eyes whenever he saw the Lord. And the last time was in chapter 22 and verse number 13, whenever he lifted up his eyes, whenever he had uh, taken Isaac up on the mountain and God said, I want you to have your son for a sacrifice. And, and he was there and he lifted up his eyes and looked and saw a ram that was caught in the thicket. What did he see there? It was his substitute. He saw a substitute. Each time he lifted up his eyes, whether it was for the land that was promised, for the Lord himself to to make of him a great nation, or whether it was a substitute for, for death, each time he lifted up his eyes, he saw a testimony of God's amazing grace. So the grace of God is still evident. The grace of God is still plentiful. You know, we can bemoan the state of the nation and, and, and talk about all the things that we don't have. Boy, we've still got it so much better than most people ever thought about. God's grace is still very much evident. It's still very plentiful. Abram was learning that there is no place that he could go that was beyond the scope of the grace of God. Can I tell you that's still true for every believer today? God's grace is still available for you. He gives saving grace to those that are lost. Aren't you glad of that? If you came to the house of God today and you're not 100% sure if you died today that you'd go to heaven and say, man, I've tried to reform my ways. I've tried to choose between the, the vile and the good and, and things of that nature. I've tried to do some kind of self-reformation. That's not what it's about. Salvation is recognizing that we're a sinner, and that sin separates us from a holy God. Amen? Uh, God and His love and His great mercy and His provision sent His only begotten Son to, to come to this earth, live a perfect sinless life, go to the cross at Calvary. Every sin that you have ever committed was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and He died in your place. He shed His perfect blood for you. The wrath of God was poured out upon His Son so that you would never have to know the wrath of God in your own life. He died on that cross. He was buried. And on the third day, up from the grave, he arose. Amen. And he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he's making intercession for us. How do you, how do you appropriate that? So the salvation was covered. The, the debt was paid, but it still has to be appropriated to your life. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not a matter of being able to work enough uh, good works to be able to get you to heaven. It's receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior is by taking that gift and whenever you receive Christ as Savior you come to Him as a, as a sinner not upon your own merit, not upon your own goodness, not upon your own personal worth, but you're putting all of your trust and hope in what Jesus accomplished for you at the, at the cross at Calvary and His death, His burial, His resurrection, and God says the righteousness of Christ is imputed to your account. So that whenever you stand before God, you don't stand in your own goodness, uh, your own righteousness alone, there's nothing but filthy rags. You stand in the righteousness righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? That saving grace that God still gives. Can I tell you, there is sustaining grace for those who are weary. You know, uh, just because you're saved doesn't mean that everything's great. Doesn't mean there's no problems. There's issues and trials. We're in the midst of, listen, we are in a sin-cursed world. Uh, about the time that you start asking, Lord, why does this happen to me? Because you live in a sin-cursed world. Amen? Sometimes it's because you made some bad decisions, but you made those bad decisions in a sin-cursed world. Amen? And yet God still gives sustaining grace. Man, this world starts to wear on you, and it's weary. There's hard times, but He still sustains. There's settled grace for the dying. Well, whenever it comes time to meet you, 
meet the Lord, you find out that the grace of God is still evident in a whole new supply. You know, God gave us a word concerning His grace through the Apostle Paul that's so needed. He said, His grace is sufficient sufficient. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's 2 Corinthians 12 and verse number 9. You know, a, a great little word there, not just the sufficient, but it's the little word that we often miss. He says, my grace is. You like to underline, circle, and put asterisks in your Bible. That's a good one to, that's a good one to highlight. Amen. He says, my grace is sufficient. It's wonderful whenever you can look back over your life and you can see uh, bad decisions that were made, directions and whatever the case, and you can look and say, I'm so thankful that the grace of God was sufficient. But even greater is to be able to look and say, the grace of God is still sufficient in the days that we have right now today. The grace of God is sufficient. It has been and always will be what we need. So then in verse number 17, Abram is told, arise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, and I will give it unto thee. He says, look at what it is. He says, by my grace, this is the land that I'm extending to you. But then he tells him, he says, now get up and start walking. Amen. God tells us if you want to establish a godly nation, a godly church, godly home, you want a godly life, get up and start walking. Amen. Walk according to the word of God. Arise and walk according to the grace of God. Now here's the thing. We look at our nation. We say, man, our nation's in need. What does our nation need? Amen. Our nation is not dependent upon whether you got a Democrat or Republican or independent. Our nation, if it's going to thrive, if it's going to succeed at all, it's going to be because God's people rise up and begin to walk according to the Word of God. It's going to take godliness. And that brings us back to this, the importance of everybody here in this room right here. Uh, we could all complain. It doesn't do the first bit of good. Amen. But God has placed you in this place at this time on purpose. You know that you could have been born at any time, any time of history. I don't know about you. There's, there's certain things where you think, it's like, man, that would have been pretty cool. I wish I would have been born at that time. Wish I would have been born in the cowboy and Indian days. You might want to check out the whole longevity of life, you know, just kind of do some research before you say that, because it's one thing to play Cowboys and Indians. It's something else to die when you're 22, you know, and, and you look like you were 81. God knew just what we needed. God knew what this nation needed. That's something else. You could have been, I mean, just a spin of the earth, man. You could have been born with a dot on your head on the other side of the world. Not knowing anything that you do. You were born in such a great privileged time and place to be able to, to know the gospel and to be able to have a time to be able to worship and honor him. God has put you here. And he says, not just to be here, not just to absorb, but to arise and walk according to his grace. He gives us the opportunity, gives us the understanding. All that stands left is whether or not we'll be in rebellion to God. If you're here and you're not saved, Today, God has given you the grace to be able to hear the gospel and to receive it for yourself. If you're not saved, man, today's the day to trust Christ. Amen. We should never presuppose upon the grace of another day. Thankful for the grace that was sufficient. Thankful for the grace that is sufficient. I'm not going to count on grace for another day. If there's a decision that needs to be made, you need to make it today. Amen. Amen. Maybe that you're here and you're on the border of a decision about what you're going to do. Are you going to serve the Lord or are you going to keep loving the world? You know, you can choose to walk with Christ this morning. The choice is yours. God's grace is sufficient for every need today. Arise and walk in accordance with His grace. Maybe you need to come to a place where in your life where you say, man, I just got to get to where I can worship Him again. Been wandering, been in the wrong place, but I need to worship him. Man, you can come back today to an altar. You can kneel down to a place where you've probably knelt before. You can thank him for his love for you and for his long suffering, the fact that he's still in control. You can thank you, thank him for uh, the fact that he still desires fellowship with you. Amen. Let's all stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your great love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the sufficiency of your grace. 
We thank you, Lord, for the needs that you meet every single day. Oftentimes we're, we get to the point where we're busy and we don't even think about how grateful that we should be. Lord, we want to thank you for this wonderful nation that you've given us. Lord, we certainly don't want to knock it. God, we can look around we can see uh, so many places that would love to have the freedoms that we have and the luxuries that we have. Lord, I pray, Father, that we not take them for granted. Help us, Lord, to arise and walk in accordance with your grace today. Lord, if there's one here that's never trusted Jesus as Savior, they're not 100% sure if they died today that they'd go to heaven. God, would you give them the courage just to be able to step out, come forward, and just say, I just need to be saved. I need to have it settled today. Lord, we want to give you the glory already for every decision made. I pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, not to align ourselves close to the world, but to get far away and walk in accordance with your word. Help us to be a godly people, Lord. We thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 300. Number 300. You need to come. Launch comes. He's already here. He'll be safe.